Good morning, everybody. Uh-huh. It's Elvis. A couple days ago was my birthday. Uh-huh. And I'm here to give you a few announcements. Uh-huh. First of all, Lord willing, we're going to open up base 215 come 7 February. Uh-huh. For Super Bowl Sunday. I hope you can make it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then we're going to go have a work day at base 215 on 16 January at 8 a.m. Hope you can make it on home. You should be there on home. Because we need all the hands we can get on home. Mm -hmm. And then finally, 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 finally. Love me tender, love me sweet. Trenton Council of Churches is going to be meeting on the 17th of January at 3 p.m. You want to be there? Zoom in with me on the Elvis channel. Oh, oh, oh. Hope you're going to be there. Love y'all. God bless you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Ho, ho. Let no one caught in sin remain inside the light. Of inward shame, but fix our eyes upon the cross and run to Him who showed great love and bled for us freely. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling over death by death. Come awake, come awake, come and rise up from the grave. Christ is risen from the dead, we are one with Him again. Come awake, come awake, come and rise up from the grave.
rise up from the grave
Well, good morning again. As we go to prayer this morning, just got a lot of praises and a, a lot of needs that I'd like to share with you very quickly. And uh, they should have been sent out through the via email. And uh, if you ever have a prayer request, I would just ask that you either call me at 618-514-1753, or you can text that to me, or you can call the church office at 224 7555 and uh, there's a voice machine there that can take that for you. We would love to pray with you, uh, whether it be a praise or a need. So, so don't be shy in doing that. Uh, we need to be praying for each other, especially during these difficult times. Let me give you a, an update on some of the praises. Abby Johnson, she's a little baby. She had three holes in her heart, and she had those uh, repaired this past week. She's doing good, but she's got COVID, and uh, she's struggling a little bit with the COVID. And, and being a baby and be susceptible to the heart. So she needs your prayers right now. So lift up little Abby Johnson at this time, if you will. Uh, Ryan and Liz Rauman are happy to announce that they're expecting another baby, a baby boy. And we, we, we rejoice in that with them. And uh, our other expectant mothers are Becca, Amber, Trisha, and Son Lee. So keep our, our uh, mamas and their babies uh, in their prayer, in your prayers. Uh, Again, we love babies at Grace Community Baptist Church. Uh, uh, the purchase and installation of the flooring at Base 215 is moving along. We praise God for that. We're, we're hoping in a couple of weeks that will be installed. And uh, so keep that in prayers as the work day as well on the 16th of January. Ward Sussenbach, uh, Luke Smith, uh, Barbara, John, Terry, Mark, they're all recovering from COVID. We've been praying for them for a couple of weeks now, if not a month. And uh, they're, all, they're all getting better each and every day. So we praise God for that as well. Uh, some needs we have. For, first and form, uh, foremost is the unrest in America. Uh, a lot going on with our country. And uh, we need to be come together. We need to be unity. Uh, we, we've got a lot of things to work out. But we as Christians, we as believers in Christ, know who to turn to. And that's Jesus. We go to him each and every day. He hears us. He loves us. So we need to... Uh, be in tune with him. And uh, we know that all, th all good things work through him. And uh, we just need to do that each and every day. So I, I encourage you to open your, the Bible, read it. I encourage you to pray each and every day to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, Deb Lassen's uh, passing for her uh, grandma. Uh, keep her in your prayers as she's mourning her passing. Uh, Don Koch and his renters, uh, Karen and Shirley, both have COVID, as does Don. Uh, so keep them in your prayers. Gordon Hall and Calvin Hartsfield are still hospitalized with COVID and some other issues. So keep them in your prayers. Uh, Melissa is a friend of Cindy Holloway's. Her grandma is recovering from COVID. As you can tell, uh, we've got a lot of COVID stuff going on in our area. It's really spiked. Uh, so we need to keep safe and uh, be watching out for each other and, uh, and praying for one another. Uh, Joan, uh, that's uh, Jane's mom. Uh, Jane Depper's mom, uh, she has bronchitis. Uh, Hunter, we, we talked about him a couple weeks ago. He was in a head-on collision, and that's uh, relation to Joey Leinbarger. He is at home, but he's got a long haul to go. He, 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 he broke a lot of bones, so keep Hunter in your prayers. Andrea Felt, our dear sister, who's been dealing with GI issues, uh, keep her in your prayers. Uh, Fran and Jim, Fran uh, Smith and Jim Holloway both have neck pain. Uh, Deb Lassen, we spoke about her earlier, but she has some lung issues. Uh, Veda Broadhouse and Todd Twinhoffel, uh, brain tumors uh, that they're dealing with. Uh, Dolores is uh, Linda Weekly's uh, mother. She's got some back pain. Marty, uh, Jim Holloway's sister, she, uh, he, she lost her husband a few months back and some, deci some decisions she needs to make for finances and uh, moving forward there. Cindy Holloway for wisdom on a wisdom on a job opening, and uh, I would ask that you be praying for your your elders and your pastor and, and the executive council, uh, those in leadership as we vision for our church in the coming year. Let us uh, go to prayer at this time. Father, we thank you that we can come to you this morning and just open our hearts to you, knowing that you hear us and you love us and you desire the best for us. Lord, we admit that we are sinners. We fall short, but Lord, we thank you for your grace. 
that covers us. Lord, the blood of Jesus Christ that covers those sins. Lord, when we confess them to you. Lord, I, I lift up all these praises. I lift up all these needs to you. Lord, uh, COVID is, is running rampant in our area, and we, we ask that that would slow down and it, it would cease. Uh, we pray for these vaccines that are coming. We pray for those who are on the front lines, Lord, who are dealing with it. Lord, I pray for those who have it right now and are having a hard time with it. Lord, just uh, lift them up to you. Lord, I, I pray for the United States of America because we feel like the divided states of America right now. And that's not good. That's not who we are. We, we are better than this. And Lord, we need to turn our faces to you. And we need to get on our knees before you. We need to open the word of God and read it. We need to pray to you each and every day. We need to be in communication with you so that you will mend our hearts, that you will, will heal our hearts, that we will turn to you. Lord, we know it's a heart issue in America. It serious, seriously is. It comes down to a heart issue. And Lord, we need people to turn back to you. Lord, for us who are following you, Lord, we, we're not self-righteous in that. We just, we're, we're bold in it. And we want to be bold uh, in, in proclaiming your, your word and who you are. So, so Father, help us to continue to be a light for you, to shine for you in the dark places. And Lord, we know that you will hear our prayers. We know that you will take our prayers. And Lord, we know you'll answer our prayers. It might not be the way we want them answered, but you will answer them as you have so many, many times. We can see that as evidence in our prayer list each and every week. Father, I thank you for this day. I pray that you'll continue to be with the rest of the service. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hello, I'm Pastor Bob Marsh. And I want to welcome you this morning to uh, our worship service. I, I uh, trust that your new year has started off well. Things are going well for you. Uh, and then if they aren't, that you've let us know and we have you on our prayer list. Uh, we certainly are excited about the many uh, praises that uh, Elder Mike was able to share during our prayer time at the beginning of the service. Uh, we're excited about some of the changes that are going to be taking place at the base and new materials that have been ordered and uh, uh, how that uh, new flooring project is going to really make that place snap and be easier to clean up. And I'm sure that the students there and parents and uh, all of you that come in and uh, see that will, uh, will appreciate it and marvel at uh, its quality and it's going to be a beautiful facility when it's done. I'm sure many of you uh, in your spirit have been uh, grieving or heavy hearted uh, based on some of the things that we saw this past week, uh, in particular um, in the protests that occurred in Washington, D.C. Um, I am all for people uh, uh, protesting whatever uh, they believe uh, their convictions are for their cause. Uh, but I believe that there's a right way to do that and there's a wrong way to do that. Um, my wife and I were horrified as we saw um, men and, and women um, climbing up on top of balconies uh, at the Capitol building um, pushing up against and breaking uh, glass uh, windows and uh, up near uh, the, uh, an entrance way into the Capitol building, eventually storming through them. Uh, eventually, they even had uh, camera shots of people walking through, protesters walking through uh, the facility. Uh, and then to find out how um, close they came to actually entering into the Senate chambers and disrupting everything that was going on there. Um, there's no way that uh, that was right. That, that, that was wrong. And there's no way that that's, that that's a biblical response uh, to our proper response where, uh, based upon God's word and what God would have us to do. Uh, I remember saying to my wife, look at that idiot. He's, they're climbing the walls. Look at, look at that idiot. He's, he's, uh, trying to uh, get up on top of a, 
the scaffolding that they used to wash windows on the outside. They had, you know, three, four, five, six men up on top of that thing, waving flags and doing all kinds of stuff. Uh, this is crazy. There, 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 there's got to be laws that are being broken here. Well, let's talk about what God's word has to do with that, about that, because, um, you know, we, we, we do get put in situations where we, we have social unrest. We disagree with decisions that have been made or certain outcomes of certain things, and it might have to do with politics and um, other things going on around us. But uh, so we live in a time of great social unrest. We, we've seen it from all ends of the spectrum uh, just in this past year. Uh, but Jesus also talks to us about having spiritual peace. And it's very difficult to have spiritual peace and be involved in social unrest at the same time. Now let's look at what God's word has to say about some of this. In James 14, verse 7, James 4, verse 17, it says, So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. So when in doubt, when we're in doubt of whether we should do something or not do something, we shouldn't do it. And if we know it's wrong, we shouldn't do it because then it's held against us as sin. Uh, Romans 13 verses 1 through 5 have a lot to speak about. Um, even some of the things that we saw uh, just this past week at the Capitol building. It says this, beginning in verse 1, it says, Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed. Now, in my 25 plus years of teaching, I've had some great principles. I've had some horrendous principles. I've had some good athletic directors. I've had some lousy athletic directors. Uh, and I remember just in my second or third year of teaching, a friend of mine who is also a devoted follower of Jesus, he was 10, 15 years older than me, he came to me with a petition and he wanted me to sign a petition to get rid of our principal. And he wasn't the best principal. Yeah, he was kind of lousy. Um, but I looked at him and said, look, what, why are you doing this? It's not your job. It's not my job to evaluate the principal. It's the superintendent's job to evaluate the principal. And, and Jesus says, in the manner that you judge, so shall you be judged. So if we do this someday, we're going to be treated the same way. Not because I say so, but because Jesus says that. And I told my friend, I, I can't have a part of that. It's not my job to evaluate this man. And so I'm not going to do this. And I don't think you should be doing it either. Well, you know what? He, he he went back to the people that he had brought that petition around first. He said, I can't do this. I'm, I'm sorry. If somebody else wants to do it, that's fine, but I'm not going to do it. So you, And you're going to have to start all over again. And he didn't sign one. And I I never signed one. Now, eventually the board did remove that that principle. He was not rehired for the next year. But, but God allowed that man to be there for a year. And he wasn't a good principal. He wasn't evil, but he just wasn't very effective. And our human nature wants to get rid of that. Chop it off, fire him, get rid of him now. But we have to we have to recognize the sovereignty of God. And what's our role in how we properly uh, display our emotions, our feelings, when we don't like what we see? It goes on to say, but there's no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. God put that person in that role. Might be a boss. You know, I don't, I don't know if you ever had a bad bo boss. Uh, uh, but studies show that uh, the number one reason why people leave a job is because they have a boss they didn't like. I, I, I left at least two different jobs where I had a boss that I didn't like, but I still showed him or her respect 
until I I left, I, even after I left. I, 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 um, because God put that person in that position and he put him in a position to accomplish his purposes, not mine. It goes on to say this, therefore, whoever resists the, author the authorities resists what God has appointed and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear for the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you'll receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. Now, for you and I today, we don't know too many bosses or leaders who walk around with a sword. But it's symbolic here. That sword represents authority and punishment that could come from the result of that. Back in biblical days, if you did something that the penalty could be death, that leader could order your death. They could use a sword or order somebody else to use a sword to put you to death. Or if it was an arm, they cut your arm off. Or if it was your tongue, they cut your tongue off. So we're warned that we are to obey and put ourselves under the authority of those people that are in leadership. Because if we don't, they, they've been given the authority to bring harm against us. Now today, it may not be being jabbed with a sword or may not having our head cut off with a sword, but it could be being written up. It could be suspended. It could be being fired. It could be having something put in your file that, or maybe a, a reference later on down the road that comes back to bite you. So we're told, he goes on to say, for he is a servant of God, that is that one placed in authority, who is an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. If we want to have a clean conscience before God and man, then we should do the right thing. And we should place ourselves under the authority of those that God's put there. You know, uh, over the years, uh, I've had, there's been a president or two that was elected that I did not like him. I maybe didn't vote for him, but I prayed for them. I earnestly prayed for them. And I did not uh, slander them or blast them. I may have disagreed with their policies, and I may have stated that I didn't agree with their policies. But I did not disrespect the position. I did not disrespect the man in that role. And I certainly didn't become an enemy of the state. But 1 Peter uh, chapter 2.13 says, Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. Now, we don't have a emperor, but we do have national leaders in authority, and we do have a governor. And in these parts, he's not very popular. But we don't have the right to not follow the state laws. And if we do, we should expect to be punished by, by him. And if we follow them and, and do right, uh, we can be commended. Uh, Romans 13, 7 also says, pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. Now, I'd like to talk about that just, just briefly. Taxes to whom taxes are owed. You know, we would never ever uh, advise somebody to withhold their taxes those taxes are used for the benefit of our entire state or our entire national, federal government, and uh, they are needed. And so we would never, ever advise someone, you know, withhold your taxes. The, that's kind of tricky for me because pastors do have to do their taxes a little bit differently. And I, I asked my sister, who's a licensed tax 
a preparer to do my taxes for me every year. And there's so many forms that go along with being a pastor. It's really tricky and it's a burden to have to pay those taxes, but, but we pay them and we know we should pay them. It also goes on to say revenue to whom revenue is owed. My lambs, Monica and I, uh, it took us 12 years to pay off my school loans. 12 years. We didn't say, well, just forgive them. Forgive us of that. Oh, well, it was a head fake, a uh, bluff. We don't really need to pay those back. Yes, we did. We, we, we owed that revenue to those institutions in which we borrowed that money. Uh, this is a quality that we just don't see in our young people today. In fact, I didn't see it in our young people 15, 20 years ago when I was coaching at uh, college kids. A lot of them just blew those loans off. Well, Scripture says we should pay the revenue to whom revenue is owed. And then also says to respect those where respect is owed. Now, let me tell you what a lot of people interpret that as. Well, I'll respect you if you're worthy of respect. That's not what the Bible teaches. It says respect those to whom respect is owed. That is the position that they're in. My, my parents taught me, rightfully so, and biblically so, that you respect the principal just because he's the principal. He might be wrong, and then you go in and you have your day with him or your, your time in his office, you talk it through. Maybe he'll change his decision or whatever, but you still don't take him on in blatant disrespect in front of other people because that would be wrong. His position is worthy of respect. Same thing with your uh, teacher. Same thing with a pastor. Same thing with a boss. We should show them respect. And then the last part there says, honor to whom honor is owed. Boy, I have seen people disrespect people within the church, and particularly pastors over the years. For 13 years, I served <coughs> as an elder uh, in, in different churches, and I saw the senior pastor just uh, disrespected by people for the craziest reasons. And that ought not to be. Because God has put that pastor there, he is owed your respect. If you can't respect him, then you should go somewhere else. But don't be a part of disrespecting them. That, that's just not what the scripture says. We're supposed to show honor to those who break the word of life to us, who feed us spiritually, uh, our teachers, our elders, uh, Sunday school teachers. We, we should show them reverence. Uh, our elderly, our parents, young people should show respect to their parents. There's no place for backtalking them or disrespecting them, or showing them up in front of us. That's just not the way it's supposed to be done. Titus 3.1 says, remind them, that is the congregation, your flock, remind your flock to be submissive to rulers, authorities, and to be obedient, to be ready for every good work. Jesus was brought standing before Pilate and and refused to answer Pilate when he was asking him about, was he a, a god? Was he a king? Were these things true? And, and, and finally, he says, uh, Pilate said, don't you know I have the authority to take your life from you or to pick it up or lay it down? And Jesus answered him in John 19, verse 11, he said, you have no authority over me unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. Well, who delivered Jesus over to Pilate, the, the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees did, did this. Uh, they they had to, were guilty of the greater sin, but he acknowledges, Jesus acknowledges that God is sovereign. And you know, the only reason why Pilate had any authority was because God had given it to him. God had put him in that position. And we would say that Pilate was evil, that Pilate made the wrong decision by having Jesus crucified, and he did. But if he hadn't, if he hadn't, you and I still would not have our sins cleansed. There would be no Lamb of God. So God put him in that position, even though the outcome for Jesus was evil. And then finally, in Matthew 22, 
the Sadducees, again, had surrounded Jesus and were trying to pick his brain and, and they really despised him. They were trying to catch him in, in some things. And so they, they came to him and they said, tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, of their hatred, said, why put me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin for the tax. And they brought him a denarii. And Jesus said to them, whose likeness is an inscription is this? They said, it's Caesar's. And Jesus said to them, well, therefore render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. You know, the IRS says that the average person in America gives only 3% of their income to nonprofit organizations. 3%. The Bible teaches that we should give at least 10%. And it goes on to chastise the people of God for withholding their tithe, the, the first of their first fruits of their income. They are chastised for that. And 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 God says to them, what have you done? You you put you use this money for for your houses and and your pleasures, uh, but return the tithe to my storehouse. Well, those are things that are God's. Give God your service. Give God your prayers. Give God time in His Word. Give God His time in worshiping Him, like you're doing this morning. Give God to Him the first of your fruits, and those are giving. To God, the things that are God's. Give to Caesar the things that are Caesar. Well, I, I hope some of this has been helpful to you with regards to what has transpired this week at the Capitol. Um, yes, there is a time when we are told to do something, we might be asked to do something by government that is illegal or ungodly against the law. Uh, certainly abortion is one of those things, and we would speak out against that. Another would be marriage. We believe that marriage is uh, to be between one man and one woman, uh, as defined in Genesis chapter 2. So when the, the federal government uh, changes the whole term of marriage, the definition of marriage to uh, be inclusive of two men or two women, that's not right. Uh, and we we cannot stay silent about that. We must, like Peter and the apostles who were standing before the Sanhedrin, say, we must obey God rather than men. But in general terms, we are supposed to submit ourselves to the authorities that are placed put in place. There's a right way to voice our displeasure, maybe, and to protest, march, uh, but then there's wrong things a wrong way to behave and certainly climbing those buildings, breaking windows, jumping through those windows, breaking a barrier and a glass in, in front. Th those were all wrong things. Those, those were sinful acts and it shouldn't have occurred. Well, um, may the peace of God guard your heart and your mind this week. And, uh, may you sense God's peace, uh, and his love, uh, and also that his presence in you and uh, continue to pray for our government. Uh, pray for a peaceful exchange now of power to our new uh, president. Pray for the Trumps as they are leaving the White House and going on to other, th other things uh, that uh, God has for them. Uh, thank you for your time this morning. And uh, if there was something that we mentioned today that just kind of struck a chord with you and you would like to talk with me some more about that, please feel free to do that. Give me a call or send me an email or whatever. We'd be glad to talk to you. Let's, let's close in prayer this morning. Father, again, we just thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that uh, you do uh, give us principles and your word helps instruct us on how we ought to act even when we are around uh, authority that we don't like. Um, and maybe even we would say, think that it's evil or wrong, uh, Father, but help us to realize that in your sovereignty, 
Sometimes you put that boss or that person or that politician uh, in our life for a reason. And you're working out your will uh, uh, for our nation or for that person. But we pray for our nation. We pray that you would bring order and peace to it. We pray somehow, some way, we can stop all the hatred and vitriol and the speech that takes place oftentimes just goes to one end or the other. Help us to love one another. Help us to be known by our love for one another. Help us to love one another. And Lord, we will give you the praise. Again, thank you for this time and this worship service this morning. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I was 10 years old, and I held my mother's gun to my head, and I wanted to blow my brains out all over her wall. You must ask the question, why would a 10-year-old child want to die? 10 is a time to dream of being an astronaut, of being a soccer star, a football player, a preacher, a pastor, a doctor. But for me, life was so horrific, with so much vitriol and pain, I wanted to die. I'm the product of interracial immigrants. My grandmother was tall, white, and thin from Germany, and we called her French fry. My grandfather was a big, burly black man from Cuba, and we called him Hamburger. Hamburger met French fry and created a Happy Meal. And these two immigrants produced seven McNuggets with special sauce. We would joke that we would have Wiener Schnitzel with salsa for Thanksgiving. My grandfather had to hide the fact in the 1940s in America that he was married to a Caucasian woman. But one wedding anniversary, he had a flaw. He liked to drink overproof Cuban rum. And one evening, he was inebriated. And a man saw them together and said to my grandmother, why would you be a nigger lover? My grandfather, with huge arms, lost his temper and hit the man in the jaw and broke his neck. The man didn't die, but he was injured severely. He went to the worst prison, convicted of the crime, Mansfield Reformatory in Ohio, locked down 23 hours a day. It hit the newspapers that my grandmother was married to this convicted felon and she lost her job. But being a German woman, she didn't complain or whine or woe is me. She began to work odd jobs, cleaning other people's houses and toilets, taking care of their children. But as she was working, she would have fainting spells, passing out, doing her job. She went to the doctor and discovered that she had a tumor growing behind her left eye that was metastasizing to her brain. And the doctor said, we have to take out a third of your face, your eye. You will be malformed and disformed and disfigured for the rest of your life. What do you do when the American dream becomes an American nightmare? She could not work. She was sick and mutilated. My grandfather's in jail. And day by day, they lost everything that they had acquired. They lost their house, they lost their car, they lost their furniture, they lost their dignity, they lost their self-esteem, and they were living in the streets like animals. My three uncles got hooked on heroin. They belonged to a gang called the Devil's Disciple, and my entire family became atheistic. No God, no prayer, no Bible, no hope, and my mother at age 14 was called by a pimp named Larry who said to her, what is school doing for you? You are sitting on a gold mine. She said, where? He said, you're sitting on it. And we call this being turned out. And little by little, she began to sell her 14-year-old body to grown men for money to survive. 
is called turning tricks. And at age 16, she got pregnant. We call it having a trick baby. Two strangers meet for a business transaction, and there's a mistake. The pimp said, you can't make any money having a baby in the oven. We have got to kill this baby. They kicked her in the stomach. They fed her alcohol. They gave her drugs. They took a hanger and stabbed the baby over and over again. But the baby would not die. The baby was born two months premature with no pancreas, a learning disability, a bladder too small, unable to function, a severe stutterer. We call it a trick baby. Nobody wants the baby. No hope, no future. Kill it was the word. That baby was me. I'm the lowest of the low. I come from the guttermost. I come from a hellish condition. And so when I would go to school, I couldn't talk. I stuttered so severely from the trauma. My mother had a madam who hated men. Her name was Dolores, and she was a sadist. And when she would watch me, she would take a broomstick and stick it in a place where no boy should have any object in his body. And when you are tortured like that, you learn four things. Don't talk. Don't trust don't feel and pretend nothing is happening. And by age 10, I had had enough. I wanted to die. And in my school, they put me in a boiler room with other kids who were dysfunctional like me, where we would finger paint all day long. And yet there was a teacher, thank God for her, who had a Gideon Bible. And she came to my school, and she saw kids like me as her mission field. And she would give me this Gideon Bible and read to me stories of dysfunctional characters who God used. She would say to me, Ronaldo, God uses greatly those who have been wounded very deeply. He will turn your pain into power, your wounds into wisdom. She had me read the story of Moses, who was also a stutterer. I began to understand that God did love a trick baby, even as low as I was. There was hope for me and possibility. And when a child begins to understand the love of God and the power of his word and the possibilities, it changes everything. How can a young man keep his way clean by taking heed according to your word. Your word have I hid in my heart that I may not sin against thee. I began to memorize the Bible, that Gideon Bible, reading 2,000 scriptures. And when you put that kind of word in a life, something begins to happen. My stuttering went away. I stopped wetting the bed. I stood tall. I became valedictorian, became a pastor and priest until everybody in my family got saved. Why? Because somebody placed the Gideon Bible in a woman's hand that changed a life forever. Yes! I was born a trick baby, but the trick was on the devil because of you and the power of the word of God.